following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So today we're going to be talking about the corruption of scripture in the early years of Christianity. And I think this is an important topic to discuss because um, a lot of people in the world, they, 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 they stake their, their souls and their, their lives on the, the words of, uh, of a book. And uh, in the, the Western Hemisphere, a lot of people rely on the, uh, the, the Christian Bible and, and the Hebrew Bible in order to determine how they live their lives. And um, I want to tell you a story about a, a, a monk in the Middle Ages, because you know, up until uh, the invention of the printing press, all the um, which, uh, which happened in the Middle Ages, all the the Bibles were copied by hand by monks, right? And so they uh, they had these monasteries where the monks basically the only thing that they did was they they they, they made copies of the Bible and they prayed. And so there was an, a new monk coming into, coming into uh, the, the, the monastery, and he was looking at all the, all the old monks that's in there copying the text. And he noticed something, that the, uh, the monks who were copying the text, they were, um, they, were, they were making copies from previous copies. And those copies had been made, been made from copies too. Right? And uh, so he, he went to the, um, the, the abbot of the monastery, and he, he said, uh, uh, Brother... Um, I noticed that all these texts that we're making are copies of copies of, of copies. Uh, but if someone made a, made a mistake in one of the early copies, then that would, uh, that would get propagated out through all the uh, uh, further copies that we make down through the ages. Uh, maybe, we should, uh, maybe we should check the original to make sure that there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. And the, uh, the abbot said, actually, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. So he went, he went down the stairs into the, 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 the basement of the monastery, and he, he opened up the vault, which hadn't been opened up for, for hundreds upon hundreds of years, where they kept the original Bible. And uh, he, uh, he was down there for, for, for several hours. And then, huffing, puffing, he comes screaming up the stairs, we forgot the R, we forgot the R. He said, what? Brother, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, it doesn't say celibate. It says celebrate. <laughs> and, and obviously that didn't really happen, right? But the principle is the same. <laughs> that, <laughs> that there could be some tiny mistake in the, in the a transcription of the Bible that um, can drastically change the meaning of what the, of, of what the text says. And if you understand how the Bible was, uh, was created and how these texts have been passed on through the ages, you, you, you realize that the, the situation I'm describing here, while it was a joke, is not far from how things actually work in reality. It, and people tend to have this, this monolithic view of what Christianity and the canon the, that the canon, which is the, it's the, the, the word we use to describe the, uh, the, the scriptures that we accept, that are, that are deemed to be uh, authoritative and true, of, of what, the, what the, this looked like. 
And even, even Gnostics, they have, the, uh, they have this view, they're like, oh, um, in the early days of Christianity, there was, there was one unified Gnostic church, and um, then uh, hundreds of years later, it sort of uh, split up, right? But in reality, if we, if we, we study the, uh, the, the, the texts and writings from that time, there were... Even from the earliest days, there were many different versions of Christianity, like even in the first century AD. Now, that doesn't mean that they were opposed to one another. You could still be working towards the same goal. You can consider modern Gnosis, for instance, that um, there's, there's a lot of uh, different opinions about, the, uh, about even the modern Gnostic doctrine. And when uh, the teachings of, of Samuel and Vior have only been around since 1950. Right, and even in this school, like some of the some of the instructors disagree with one another. Like we we, we always we like to talk about Thich Nhat Hanh. Like one of our instructors is a big fan of Thich Nhat Hanh, and uh, an, another one that doesn't think that he's uh, doesn't think that he's so great. Um, uh, I I uh, I tend to disagree with uh, one of our uh, other instructors about the chemical composition of the sun. Um, that doesn't mean that that that, that we're enemies. We just have have. have Different opinions, and he has his reasons for believing that the sun is made of certain things, and I have my reasons for believing the sun is made of certain things. We teach at the same school, right? Uh, and we're still friends, so we're still working towards the same, the same goal. It just even though we have different opinions, we're, we're still, we're still uh, on the same team, if you will. And so there were many different versions of Christianity, even in the first century. And there were many different scriptures that were, that were floating around. Um, we only have a, uh, a portion of these scriptures because uh, many of them were, were destroyed by, uh, by people who thought they were, they were doing a, a good deed for humanity. Maybe they were. Who knows? And in addition to different scriptures, different communities around the, uh, uh, around the, the, uh, around the world had different canons. They had different, not only were there different scriptures, but there were different subsets of these scriptures that were accepted as authoritative in different Christian communities around the, uh, the, the Middle East and in, in, in Rome and in Europe. And the decision of what to include in the modern canon is something that took place gradually over the course of hundreds of years. It's not like they sat down in a in a, uh, a meeting one day and said, okay, uh, this is what we're, we're going to include in the modern canon. That's, that, was the, that was something that took place over uh, centuries, that the, the canon was, was finally, uh, uh, finally fleshed out. Now, this is important to understand how the, uh, what the, how the canon looked and how the scriptures looked, because before the, this was before the information age. Uh, and... In that time, it was difficult to verify the authenticity of the writings, right? So you couldn't log onto the internet and, and see the original. So you're like, okay, uh, my, my, my version has this, but it, it differs from this one. You probably only had one copy of a particular text for your, your community. And you couldn't call on the phone and check with the author to see like, oh, did you actually write this thing that you, uh, this, this says that you wrote, right? Most people were... Illiterate. And forgeries were, were actually very, very commonplace. And even in the, even in the modern canon, that we, 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 we think there should be like some, some checks on these things, there are many texts that are broadly considered to be outright forgeries. Now, we can't, we can't know for certain, right? But there are certain things about certain texts that make us suspicious. Uh, like, for instance, um, the first and second letter to Timothy and the, the letter to Titus claim to be written by Paul, um, but there are certain aspects of those texts that make us uh, suspect that, that there's, something, there's, there's something amiss about them. Um, in, the, in these particular letters, he uses vocabulary that, that doesn't show up in the, any of the letters that we... Um, we're fairly confident were actually written by him. Like if you, if you um, people who know language, who study language, know that, that uh, most people tend to make, make use of the same 
set of words in their vocabulary, that we, we tend to be familiar with certain words and we tend to use them over and over in order to communicate. And so it's, it's, uh, it's unusual to, um, for someone to pull out a bunch of words that, that, uh, in, in a particular text that they, they just don't ordinarily use. Right? And the words that we notice that Paul doesn't use in his other texts that appear in these letters um, tend to be words that are much more commonly used by writers, uh, Christian writers of the second century. Right? So it, uh, it leads modern scholars to suspect that, that maybe these letters by Paul, um, by quote-unquote Paul, uh, maybe weren't actually written by Paul, but, but could have been written later on by, uh, by uh, writers in the second century. Now, these forgeries were not necessarily made by sinister people. Right? One, one bishop uh, during this time was actually, they, they caught him in a forgery. Like, I, I, I forget which text it was. It's not in our modern Bible. It was like, like uh, three Thessalonians or something like that. And he, uh, he said, I did this in the spirit of Paul, saying, well, this is, uh, I know Paul's been dead for 50 years, but this is what he would have written um, if, if he had to deal with the things we have today. So the, <laughs> he was caught, right? Um, but but he, he wasn't doing it because he was trying to be evil. He was doing it because he thought this was what, what Paul actually would have, uh, would have, would have, uh, would have said if he was, he was alive that day. And he just, he just said uh, this it was written by Paul, right? Um, we're fairly confident that, that certain letters were, were actually written by Paul. And that's, that's the, the letter to the Romans, um, the first and second letter to the Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Philippians, the first letter to the Thessalonians, and uh, Philemon. And uh, many of his other letters are disputed. Now, it's important to remember that we can't say anything for certain about any of these texts. So even though, uh, even though we, we have our suspicions about like 1 and 2 Timothy, um, we, can't, we, we, don't, we don't have the original text for any book of the Bible. They're, they're, just, they're, they're, they're lost. They were destroyed. Right? And so it's not like we can go and we can compare the handwriting between these texts and say like, oh, uh, these two match up. And so, like Samuel, for instance, uh, he thought that 1 Timothy was written by Paul. And uh, I respect Samuel a lot. And so, um, like I said, these are, these are analyses that were done by, by modern scholars. And uh, we, we can't say for certain, but there are certain techniques that, that scholars are using nowadays comparing manuscripts in order to um, try to, uh, try to establish what versions of the manuscripts are we, we can consider authentic? Because what was happening here is sort of like what was, what was happening in the, in the monastery in, 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 the, in the joke at the beginning, that people were, were making copies of these books by hand. It, it was the, there was this profession called a scribe, and what the, their, their job was was to, was to make copies of these books. And they, 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 they didn't typically have the original to make a copy from because there's only one original. But they would have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and they would copy that copy. Um, and that was how the, that was how the scriptures were, were propagated throughout the early Christian world. And as you, might have, as you might realize if you've ever tried to copy something by hand or even, even on, a com, on, on a computer, that people make mistakes. That it, here's this, this long text uh, you don't even have a, like a, a nice modern ballpoint pen, right? So you're, you're, you're just sitting there with your, 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 your freaking quill and you have to, uh, uh, every letter you have to dip it in the ink. And it's, you're, it's, a, it's a tiresome job and uh, you're, 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 you're sitting there working with, with, with poor lighting and uh, you're, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's difficult and, and people make mistakes. And even today when people are a lot more literate than they were in, in those days, um, People would make a lot of mistakes if they had to copy this, this big, long text by hand. Because you, you, you get tired, you start, to, you start to get sleepy, right? And back in those days, the writing skills were a lot worse. And so we have over 5,300 manuscripts of the New Testament texts in Greek alone, extending from the 2nd century down to the, the, the 16th century. 5,300 5, different versions of, of the, the, the 27 books that make up the New Testament. And none of them, none of them, zero, 
are alike. None of them are identical. In fact, there are more differences between the different manuscripts for the New Testament texts than there are words in the New Testament. There are so many discrepancies between these different texts that they cannot be counted even with the help of computers. We, we, we don't even know how many there are, but we, we, there, there are estimates that it's, 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 in, it's in the hundreds of thousands easily. Now, most of these mistakes that I'm describing are fairly, fairly innocuous. Um, a scribe missed a letter here, or he was, he was, copying, he was copying a line, right? And uh, when he went to copy the next line, he skipped a line, so he, he, he left a line out of the text. It's, it's something that you'd, uh, you'd expect for, from a tired scribe, right? And it's easy to see, analyzing the text, what the mistake was and, and why they made the mistake. However, some of these mistakes, quote-unquote mistakes, um, were more likely motivated by other reasons. And um, I want to give credit here where, where credit is due. I'm not, uh, I'm not a scholar in this area. Um, but there are people whose career it is to, to study these texts. And so um, I'm... Uh, for many, much of the analysis I'm, I'm doing today, I'm, I'm uh, uh, taking from a, a scripture scholar named Bart Ehrman, um, who spent most of his life studying these, studying these manuscripts and, and looking at the, uh, the, 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 the differences between the different versions. Um, and he has this, this, this book that I'm getting it from called The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Um, I don't recommend you, you buy this book because it's written for academic audiences. Um, and if you've ever written any, uh, read anything by, um, by academics, it tend to be boring, right? So most of the book goes through just evidences that he found, or looking, looking across different manuscripts for why, these, um, uh, why he believes that, that certain versions of the scriptures are, are, are more accurate than, than others. He also kind of expects you to be fluent in Greek. Um, <laughs> so he has other books that are more interesting if you're, um, if you, if you're interested. But um, we're not going to be talking about all the changes that, that, are, uh, that he talks about because, um, like I said, there's, there's, there's hundreds, of, hundreds of thousands. Um, and we only have like, like an hour-long lecture. Um, and so we're, we're restricting our analysis to particular types of corruptions that took place only within the first couple centuries of Christianity. So within like, like uh, the second or third century AD or earlier. Um, and only with respect to certain, certain uh, theological controversies that were taking place in the, in the church at the time. Um, in particular, we're going to be looking at um, certain, uh, the, the changes that were made to scripture in response to certain controversies that were happening in the field of Christology. And that's the study of the, the nature and person of, of Jesus Christ, who he was and what he meant. Now, it's important to remember that the, the, what we now consider the modern orthodoxy, uh, uh, what, what we, uh, in the modern world, what we typically call orthodox is sort of like the, the, the Catholic version of, of Christianity or even the modern Protestant version of Christianity. That just didn't exist in the first couple centuries of Christianity. Like I was explaining, there, were, the, the, there, were, there was a wide spectrum of different Christian theologies that were uh, popping up in, in, different, in different communities. There was no like, central organization that, that was, um, that was uh, uh, sort of like the authoritative source on everything to say and, and, and about Jesus, right? And yet even in those days, there were still people who... Um, espoused theologies that, we, that are now related to what, what are now uh, like the, the, what would be considered the orthodox theology or like a Catholic theology. But they weren't called Catholics or Orthodox then because they were just one of about a hundred different theologies. And uh, they happened to become dominant um, through, uh, for, for various uh, political reasons. And so... Um, the, the term that scholars used in order to refer to those people were, were proto-Orthodox. So the people who looked like modern-day Orthodox before they were actually um, politically dominant. 
And so the early Christian church was, uh, was struggling with um, trying to figure out what this idea of uh, what Jesus actually meant and, and, and what Christianity actually meant because it was, it was, a, it was a pretty new religion. And so um, in respect to the, the context that we're going to be talking about some of the corruptions, um, we're, I'm going to go over three specific types of uh, what could be called uh, now heresies. It's not good to call them heresies because heresies um, implies that there is an orthodoxy. And like I said, because heresy means something uh, opposed to the orthodox, something uh, different from the orthodox. Um, and there was no orthodox at that time. But... Uh, they're called heresies now. We're going to talk about three of them and how they were perceived by, uh, by the proto-Orthodox at that time. One of them is called adoptionism. And the idea behind adoptionism is that uh, Jesus was not born the Son of God, but was adopted as God's Son sometime during his lifetime. And the, they typically mention it as, as his baptism. And so Eusebius, in his, his, uh, his church history, he describes the, uh, the people who espouse this idea, called the Ebionites, this way. He says, the evil demon, however, being unable to tear certain others from their allegiance to the Christ of God, yet found them susceptible in a different direction, and so brought them over to his own purposes. The ancients quite properly called these people Ebionites, which means the, the poor, because they held poor and mean opinions concerning Christ. For they considered him a plain and common man who was justified only because of his superior virtue and who was the fruit of the intercourse of a man with Mary. In their opinion, the observance of the ceremonial law was altogether necessary, that is, the Jewish law, on the ground that they could not be saved by faith in Christ alone and by a corresponding life. So there was this, there, there was this particular idea about Jesus that was uh, being espoused by, um, by, by certain Christian communities at that time. And... Um, there were other Christian communities that took issue with this, that thought they were wrong, and so they gave them the title the Ebionites, or, or the poor. There's also this idea called separationism. And this, the, the separationism is this idea that um, the physical person of Jesus Christ, of Jesus, and God, or the Christ, were separate entities, and that Christ entered into Jesus at some point during his life. And so this idea, um, which may be familiar with some of you, is called separationism. There was also this idea called docetism. And there was uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the principle behind docetism is that Jesus wasn't actually human at all. He was sort of like this ethereal phantom that looked human but was actually an entirely spiritual entity. Right? And so... I don't want to, uh, we're not going to talk about the, the merits of these views, um, whether they were true or false, either way. That's, that's not, the, uh, not the purpose of, of this particular lecture. In each of these cases, um, I think that both those who espouse these views and those who oppose them were kind of taking a blunt instrument to the interpretation of the scripture. That the, the, the true understanding of Christ is actually much more nuanced than this. But what's important is not necessarily what these people actually believed, but how these beliefs were perceived by those uh, who, were, who were in authority. All of the descriptions that we have of these particular theological views come from the enemies of, those, uh, uh, of these views, right? And so you have, to, uh, you have to understand that when we characterize these views and when we talk about them, the only, the only descriptions we have of them are written by their, their enemies, which typically isn't the, uh, the, the, most, the most reliable source of, um, uh, uh, of information about uh, a particular person. You don't want to go up to someone who hates, uh, who, who, who hates you uh, and, and say, like, uh, uh, describe me to my friends, right? <laughs> Because uh, they, 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 they typically don't give them the justice, the justice that they deserve. There's this uh, uh, sort of a, a, a fallacy in logic called the straw, a straw man argument, where it's easy to beat up a particular view if you, um, if you just compose a straw man of that view that can't, that, that can't defend itself, then you beat up the straw man, right? And so the... Uh, 
We don't think that the, uh, that the descriptions of these particular, uh, the, these particular Christological views really give them the, uh, the, the nuance or the justice that they deserved. But like I said, what's important is not what, they, not what these communities actually believe, but how they were perceived by those who were copying these scriptures. And so in, in trying to combat these theological views, many, uh, uh, many Christian leaders at the time would, uh, would write books or, or, or letters trying to say like, oh, uh, beware of these people in your midst who are, um, who are uh, trying to spread false theologies. Paul did this too. It's just um, it, trying, to, uh, uh, trying to correct people from, from fixing false views. But in addition to writing these letters, sometimes the, the scribes who were copying the scriptures would also amend the scriptures in order to make the scriptures say what they knew they already meant. Right? And so there, was, there, were, uh, there were certain parts of scriptures that, would, um, that were particularly conducive to supporting these views that the scribes knew were wrong anyways, right? And so in order to try to make sure that the scriptures could not be used by these different groups in order to support their, their views, the scribes would often make changes to the scriptures in order to make them look more orthodox. Orthodox, what I mean in the, in the modern sense. Now, it's important to remember that all groups probably did this. Um, however... We only have evidence that the, uh, that the proto-Orthodox groups were doing this. And the reason is that if there were non-proto-Orthodox scribes making copies of these scriptures, and they made copies of the scriptures and then made amendments to the scriptures that tended to um, favor their particular theological views over the proto-Orthodox views, then when the proto-Orthodox came to power politically, which they, which they did over time, and now we have things like the Vatican that were, were very powerful, especially in the Middle Ages, right? Um, they destroyed all the scriptures that um, disagreed with their views. And so all the, um, say like, they say the winners write history, and the winners also write the scriptures. And so all the texts that they considered heretical, contrary to their theology, were destroyed. And so all the remaining texts that we have only reflect changes that were um, favorable to the Catholic version of theology, or better, better said, the proto-Orthodox version of theology. And so we're going to be talking about uh, a few of those changes. Like I said, we, we can't go through all of them because there were hundreds. Um, but we're going to be talking about a few of those changes in the context of the, of, of the, the Gnostic teachings. Now, one of, the, one of the things that if, if, you've, uh, if you've studied Catholicism, one of the things you might know that they, they, they have a, um, they're very, very adamant about the, uh, the virginity of Mary and that she was a virgin before, during, and after, uh, after the birth of Jesus. And so we can, um, it would be uh, difficult for them to explain away things like uh, the Bible calling Joseph Jesus' father, Right? And so we can look at the, um, for instance, Luke chapter 2, verse 33, or in, the, um, in the, the, the modern Bible, it says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Right? That's what the, uh, the, the current Bible says. Um, but we have earlier texts, and uh, the... Because we can compare these different versions of the, of the New Testament text, right? And so we can see, like, when did it start saying in Joseph and his mother? And we can, we can compare it to, to texts that we can easily date as being earlier. And we have earlier superior texts that say, and his father and mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Um, and so the earlier and superior text had this original version referring to his father as, being, as marveling. Um, but the, uh, they were concerned about people maybe misinterpreting this and thinking that Joseph was actually his father, because that's what it says in the Bible, right? And so they changed it to say, and Joseph and his mother, to uh, imply that Joseph was not really his father, right? 
And this, this modified version of, uh, uh, appears in the majority of our Greek manuscripts, as well as the old Latin, Syriac, and, and Coptic texts. And the, but the, the older one still references his father. Two of the Greek texts delete the entire genealogy of Adam to Joseph. That's, uh, that's Luke chapter 3, verses 24 to 38. They just deleted it. Um, and a number of them also change uh, 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 when, it's refers, uh, a num- when it refers to Joseph as Mary's husband, a number of the texts change it to Mary's betrothed, right? Because they didn't want to imply that Joseph was actually like, like married to Mary in the sexual way because that would imply she wasn't a virgin, right? Um, and so they, um, they, they changed it to just being her betrothed in order to, to uh, eliminate any possibility of people thinking that, 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 that Joseph and Mary were actually really married, right? However, when we, look, when we look at this, it's important to have an understanding of what the, what the virgin birth actually meant. That in the modern like, Christian theologies, many people look at, the, look at the doctrine of the virgin birth and they think that that actually meant that, that Mary never sexually connected with anyone, right? And so they, 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 they take this, they, they get into all these ridiculous things like, oh, how, where, did, where did Jesus get his Y chromosome? And they make up these, these, these ridiculous stories, right, to try to uh, explain this, this, this doctrine. But it's important to remember that the doctrine of the, of the virgin birth of the, or the immaculate conception actually refers to something, uh, something spiritual. And so Blavatsky talks about this here, right? And she says this quaternary, father, mother, son, as a unity, and, and, and a quaternary as a living manifestation, so life is the fourth part of that quaternary, has been the means of leading to the very archaic idea of immaculate conception, now finally crystallized into a dogma of the Christian church which carnalized this metaphysical idea behind any common sense, right? So it's, it's just ridiculous to think that Mary actually gave birth to a son uh, without sex. Like, that just doesn't happen. It's, it's literally physically impossible. That's not what the Immaculate Conception is about. That's not what the, the virgin birth is about. And Blavatsky continues, For one but has to read the Kabbalah and study its its numerical methods of interpretation to find the origin of that dogma. It is purely astronomical, mathematical, and preeminently metaphysical. The male element in nature, personified by the male deities in the Logoi, Baraj or Brahma or Horus or Osiris, is brought through, not from an an immaculate source, personified by the mother, because that male, having a mother, cannot have a father, the abstract deity being sexless. And not even a being, but beingness or life itself. This was repeated on earth, the, mis- the mystery enacted according to the seers on the divine plane. The son of the immaculate celestial virgin, or the undifferentiated cosmic protile, Matter in its infinitude is born again on earth as the son of the terrestrial Eve, our mother earth, and becomes humanity as a total, past, present, and future. For Jehovah, or yod heh vav heh is androgyne, or both male and female. Above, the sun is the whole cosmos. Below, he is mankind. And so Blavatsky is explaining what should be understood by the doctrine of the virgin birth, that it doesn't actually mean that Mary physically gave birth to Jesus without sex. That would be uh, impossible. It just doesn't happen. We're not talking about a violation of the physical law here. What we're talking about is a a mythological uh, description of something that happens and the spirit on the spiritual planes, and something that needs to happen within us, which is the, the, the birth of the interior Christ by the divine mother who is always a virgin, right? And so, 
But the, uh, the, the proto-Orthodox, trying to carnalize this idea, that is making, making it flesh, tried to change the Bible in order to, um, or to make it seem like it's, it's saying something that it, it, it didn't. Going further, um, about another text, Tertullian, who was one of the early church fathers, um, claims, he claims, that certain people had corrupted the text of John 1.13. Do I have this here? Yeah, here's, uh, here's John 1, 12 to 13. And what the text says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, when Tertullian, in his, in his, uh, his big book called De Carne Christi, or On the Flesh of Christ, he claims that verse 13 here should say, which was born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And he says that the, uh, the, these heretics corrupted the text in order to make it, in order to make it say who, which were born. And if it, if it says which were born in the plural then it refers back to those who can become the sons of God, to those that believe on his name, right? Tertullian claims that it should be singular. It should say who were born, who, who was born, right? And so that the only one who could be born not of blood nor of the flesh was Jesus, physically Jesus, because Tertullian's version of the text had it in the singular. Unfortunately for Tertullian, I'm sure he was a nice guy. He wrote this whole chapter about uh, how these idiots had corrupted his text. He was actually using the broken version of the text. <laughs> right? Um, it was an honest mistake, but the true version was plural. And uh, we have so many, so many uh, different texts that have it in the plural version that... Uh, 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 even, even the, the monolithic Catholic Church couldn't destroy it. Um, so the, the plural version comes in our, it comes in our, our, our modern version of the, uh, of the Bible. But I put, this, I, I put this, uh, this up here because now the text, we know, we know it says, which were born not of the blood nor of the will of flesh, but of God, right? And it's in order to become the sons of God, it says, those that believe on his name. So, what does it mean to believe on his name? The, the, the word here is, is pistua, uh, which comes from the Greek word pistis, which we've talked about before, um, means, means faith. And to have, to have true faith is to have experience of something, right? That when you're Unfaithful to your spouse is not because you believed in some other spouse. It's because you actually did something that would categorize you as unfaithful. So this, this faith means experience, to actually embody it, to live it, right? But what is the name? What is the name? So we have this commandment in the... Uh, given to us in Exodus and Deuteronomy, saying, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Right. Now, I went to Catholic school. When we were in Catholic school, we, um, they taught us that this commandment meant that you should never say, uh, say God, the word God, in vain. Because um, apparently the English word God was the, the holy and unutterable name of the eternal creator of the universe. Right? God. Just that word. And so you can never say, oh, my God, and they, or they punish you. Um, so that's, the, that's, that's like the second grade understanding. But we're not in second grade anymore, right? So it's time for us to, uh, to have a more mature understanding of the meaning of this second commandment, meaning of the name. And so in the Zohar, they're talking about the second commandment. And Rabbi Shimon, so he, eats, he says, the holy name is mentioned only in connection with a completed world. 
as it is written, in the day that Hashem Elohim made the heavens and the earth. From this it follows that one should not mention the holy name in vain, as it is written, you shall not take the name of Hashem, your Elohim, in vain. So what does he say here? The name is mentioned only in connection with a completed world. And Jehovah Elohim made the heavens and the earth. So what is the earth? Malkuth, right? And what is the heavens? The heavens are the Sephiroth above Malkuth. The vital world. The astral world. The mental world. The causal world. Up into the heavens. The different spiritual dimensions that are above the physical world. This quote he has here from Genesis talks about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Now we've given several courses about the seven days of Genesis. And these seven days describe the elaboration of of the soul, the interior development of the human being on each of the seven sephiroth that make up the lower portion of the tree of life. The first day, Malkuth, the second day, you saw it, all the way up to the seventh day. The elaboration of each of those spheres of, of, of creation, right? And so the holy name is mentioned only in connection with a completed world. That is, the completion of the seven days of Genesis, the interior development of the human being and all of these, all of these planes of existence. So how does that relate to Jesus? Well, his name is Yeshua in Hebrew, which is, if you look at it, yod Hey vav Hey, the holy name, the holy name of God, imbued with the shin, which is symbolic of the fire. And so to believe in the name of, of Yeshua can only be done in connection with the completed world because his name is the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav He. And so to truly have pistuo or pistis of that, of that name, is to manifest that archetype in yourself, to have the completion of the seven days of Genesis, the internal development of the human being, and have that imbued with the fire of the Christ. Moving on. We'll talk about the third chapter of Luke, verse uh, 22. Now, in the original version, this is talking about the baptism of Jesus. It says, And the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which says, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Now that might seem unfamiliar to a lot of you, because in the, in the modern version of the Bible, it says, Thou art my son, in thee I am well pleased. This modified version doesn't actually appear until around the 4th century AD. So this, this, this text had been circulated for hundreds of years before someone changed it to say, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. However, even as late as the 6th century, the original reading, did I put my map in here? No, I didn't. Okay. I filled out a map. But the original reading, the one that says, This day I have begotten thee, was found in a very, very wide area. Um, in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey, um, Palestine, Alexandria, which is in, in, in Egypt, North Africa, Rome, Gaul, which takes up about half of Europe, and Spain. Right? And then around the 6th century, the original version just like abruptly disappears. Poof gone, right? Now, the original version, it matches Psalm uh, chapter 2, verse 7. And it relates to a, 
the coronation of the Messiah. That's what, 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 uh, what, what David writes in the, in the Psalms. Right? But as you, might, uh, as you might imagine, this words from, from heaven saying, this day I have begotten thee, might have been problematic for the, um, for the, the people who were trying to push the view that, that Jesus was born fully the Son of God from his physical birth. If he was actually born the Son of God from his physical birth, why is, this, why is this additional begetting happening at his baptism? Right? And so they needed to stamp that out fast. And so they, uh, they changed it to say, in thee I am well pleased. Now the psalm says, it, it relate, like I said, it relates to a coronation. And if you read Samuel and Vior, in his description of the baptism, he calls this a coronation for Jesus. He said, when Jesus entered the temple, John was dressed in his priestly garments. Thus he, com- he commanded Jesus to remove his vestures. And Jesus undressed, and only his sexual organs remained covered with a white cloth. Thereafter, Jesus came out of the vestibule and entered the sanctuary. And there John anointed the Lord with pure oil and poured water over his head. It was in those moments when three stars resplendently shone within the internal heaven of the Spirit, and through the third star, red as living fire, from that heaven of the Spirit descended Hokmah, the Spirit of Wisdom. Yes, this was the supreme moment in which the spirit of wisdom entered within Jesus through his pineal gland. The Father, only visible to the eyes of the spirit, did not enter in those moments within the body of Jesus. He only attended the coronation of the Buddha Jesus, riding his chariot of fire. And this is how the coronation of the Buddha Jesus happened. So Samuel and Vior is describing this moment of the baptism as the emergence of Christ or the entrance of, of Christ, this principle, this Christic, Christic archetype, the manifestation of that within Jesus, a coronation, which matches up what, what it says in the, in the Psalms 2 7. <clears throat> now, the modified version, in thee I am well pleased, that's what it, that's what it has, what, that's what it happens, uh, what they have in Mark. One, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 11. So it's not something they completely pulled out of nowhere. They were, but they changed the, the, uh, the verse of Luke in order to try to harmonize it with the, um, the, the, the alternate text in Mark. Because they also had to come up with a reason to say, like, how come in, in, the, uh, in Mark he says one thing, but in Luke he says another thing? What is that supposed to mean? Did he say both things? How, how, come, how come he didn't say that? Because uh, they... It's important to understand that, the, that the, the Bible is not meant to be literally interpreted. That the archetypes that are, that are presented in these myths are not meant to be understood as things that actually literally happened exactly as they, exactly as they are. Exactly as they're described. Sort of like the virgin birth is not meant to be understood as Mary gave birth without, without ever having known a man, right? That they're, they're, it's meant to be interpreted symbolically as myths that are, that are meant to inform us about our own internal spiritual development, our own internal spiritual path, and what we have to manifest within. However, those who want to argue that the Bible is uh, literally happened, it becomes a great difficulty for them if there are different stories saying different things. And so we talked about how Luke was harmonized to, um, to Mark, right? And this practice of taking the different versions of the, of the synoptic gospels, that's uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and changing them in order to make them match what the other versions of the story said was virtually ubiquitous. We mentioned one example of that here, but it happened all the time. 
the original versions of these books were actually much more different than they are in the modern Bible. And over time, they were changed by scribes in order to make them look similar, in order to make the story seem identical so that it didn't create issues for people who would say, oh, these books are saying, are saying different things, right? And so the modern Bible typically has the, modern, the, the, the modified versions of these, uh, these scriptures. Another one, since we were just talking about Mark 1.11, um, we could also look at this description of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of the baptism. And in his version, he says, And straight away, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit, like a dove, descended into him. That's what it said originally. That's the, uh, the Greek word... Uh, uh, ice, right? Now, this, because remember we were talking about the, uh, the, this idea of separationism at the, uh, at the, the beginning of the lecture, um, that the, the, the Jesus and the Christ were separate entities and the Christ entered into Jesus at some, at some point. And so it, it's, it's, it's created difficulty if we have the Spirit entering into Jesus at his baptism in the account by Mark. But that's easy to fix, right? Because it's just one word. And so we, 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 the, modern verse, the modern Bible says, And straight away coming up of the water, he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit like the sub descended onto him. Right? And uh, we just have to change two letters there. It changed the Greek word ice to the word epi, which means onto instead of into. And now the dove is no longer going into Jesus, but it's just sort of sitting there. Right, so now Jesus didn't actually acquire the Christ during his baptism. It's just, it's just sort of a dove, just sort of like, like floating in his vicinity. Right? And so that it managed just to eliminate the, the possibility that these, that these people who were arguing that the Christ and Jesus were, were, were separate entities, that the Christ actually entered into Jesus, um, they can no longer use this verse in order to support their, support their views. But like I said, the, the earlier and superior versions of the text that we have say, actually, I do have this word, this Greek word, ice, which means into more than, than onto. Um, but the modern version has onto because it was changed fairly early from, from ice to, to epi in order to, we suspect, combat this view of the, uh, the, the separationism. There were other, uh, this was a fairly... Um, that's a fairly minor change, right? We're just like we, we can keep the keep the epsilon and just 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 just, just change the iota and the uh, sigma to uh, change two letters, and we can change the whole meaning of the verse, right? But sometimes, sometimes the, the changes are a little more um, egregious. Here was an example from Acts chapter eight, thirty six to thirty eight. Now, the original version says something like this. It says, And they went on their way. They came unto a certain water. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And a eunuch said, See, here is the water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. So the eunuch said, here's the water, let me be baptized, right? Now, somewhere along the way, verse number 37 was inserted into the text. And it wasn't there originally. So, now the eunuch asked to be baptized, and Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Right? And so they wanted to, to add, this, add this thing that wasn't in the text originally, saying, now you have to make this profession of faith. I believe in Jesus Christ that he was the Son of God with all my heart. And that allows him to be baptized. Previously, there was no impediment to baptism. Um, but somewhere, somewhere along the way, they, they, they said that this is, this is creating difficulties for us. And so they added this whole, this whole verse about saying you need to believe in Jesus Christ in order to be baptized and that he was the Son of God, yada, yada, yada. And so um, that's, that's something that's very, very reflective of a, a, a modern interpretation of Christianity that in order to be saved, you need to, you need to re 
raise your right hand and make some sort of profession of faith that this, this idea of your beliefs actually um, has some, some bearing on your, uh, on, on your, your, spirit, your, your, your spiritual life. That somehow you can, um, you, if, you, if you believe, then all your sins can just be magically washed away. Um, but that's something that, was, that, that, that wasn't part of the original Christianity, but came to be, uh, uh, came to be espoused in, in modern times, quite possibly as a result of, of things like this. Another example that um, I thought it was useful to point out, where Paul in his letter to the Romans, he says, now I say that Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of, for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now, um, this could create difficulty for those who understood Christ as a universal principle, Right? And so, it was often, mod- it, was, it was modified so that it now says, now I see that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And so this was made in order to emphasize the personality of Jesus. To combat those who thought, again, that Jesus and the Christ were, were separate entities. And in general... They found a lot of evidence of this, that this is just one example that I, I gave you here. But this taking of any of the elements of, 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 the, of the name Our Lord Jesus Christ, the scribes tended to, um, when they found this in any of the scriptures, they tended to expand it. So they could see Our Lord in the, in the, in the verse, and they expanded that to say, our Lord Jesus Christ. Or they could see Christ in the verse like they saw here. And they expanded it to say, our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And so this happened in a lot. I mean, a lot of places. And so that in the modern Bible, we often see Jesus, Jesus Christ or our Lord Jesus Christ or some variation on that. And the original text really did not spell it out that way. The, the, the original texts were actually much uh, more ambiguous about what they, what they were referring to. And I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from, uh, from, from Bart Ehrman here. He, was, he, was, uh, he talked about a lot of these changes. He says, these changes are not to be regarded as merely incidental to the, to the tradition or as deriving from an unreflected desire on the part of Christ, Christian scribes to say everything possible about Jesus at every available turn. The scribal tendency to call Jesus Kyrios, or Lord, and to apply to him a string of exalted appellations ultimately stems from theological debuts of the second century in which proto-Orthodox Christians emphasized the unity of Jesus Christ in face of the separationist Christologies that claim that each of Jesus' names and titles referred to separate or distinct divine entities. So, there was this, the, due to, due to this, this Christological controversy that I told you about before, um, they wanted to emphasize the personality of Jesus as being what these scriptures were referring to. And it's trying to, trying to amend the scriptures to make it seem like, uh, to, make, to make it difficult for those who are claiming that, that the personality of Jesus and the actual Christ were separate, um, make it difficult for them to actually use the scriptures to argue this point. And so they changed the scriptures at every available turn in order to make it say things like Jesus Christ or only said Christ. And Samuel and Vior talks about this Christ principle here and what it means. And he says, the descent of Christ into the heart is a cosmic and human event of immense transcendence, which indeed corresponds to the Venustic initiation. Unfortunately, what the Christ is has not been understood. Many assume that Christ was exclusively Jesus of Nazareth, yet they are wrong. Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth as a man, or better said, Yeshua ben Pandira as a man, received the Venustic initiation. Jesus incarnated Christ. 
Nonetheless, he is not the only one to receive that initiation. Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great god Ibis of Thoth, also incarnated Christ. John the Baptist, who many considered the Christus as the anointed one, the Messiah, unquestionably received the, the Venustic initiation. John incarnated the universal Christ principle. The Nazarenes were known as Baptists, Sabians, and Christians of St. John. Their belief was that the Messiah, Jesus, was not the Son of God, but simply a prophet who wanted to follow John. In those days, there were disputes among the Baptists, the Essenes, and others. So how should we understand what Christ is? Christ must not be understood as a person, nor as an individual, because Christ is beyond the personality, the I, and individuality. Christ, in authentic esotericism, is the solar logos, represented by the sun. When a human being is properly prepared, he or she then passes through the Venustic initiation. By means of the Venustic initiation, one manages to incarnate the cosmic Christ in oneself, within one's own nature. He quotes a, uh, a medieval mystic here. Uselessly, Christ in Bethlehem would have been born if, with, if within our own heart he is not also born. Uselessly, he would have died and resurrected in the Holy Land if he does not die and resurrect within us again. Samuel continues, This is the nature of the Salvator Salvandus. The intimate Christ must save us, but he saves us from within. Those who await the coming of Jesus Christ in a remote future are wrong. The Christ must come now from within. The second coming of the Lord is from within, from the very depths of our consciousness. This is why it is written, If you hear that he shall come unto you, behold, Christ is in the marketplace. Do not believe them. Behold, he is preaching in the temple. Believe them not. Samuel continues, Listen, this time the Lord will not come externally, but internally. If we are prepared, he will come from the very bottom of our hearts. The gospel clarifies this by saying in John chapter 1, verse 16, And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. So there is documentation about it. If we study carefully Paul of Tarsus, we will see that he rarely addresses the historical Christ. Each time that Paul talks, talks about Jesus Christ, he addresses the inner Jesus Christ, the intimate Jesus Christ, who must arise from the bottom of our spirit, of our soul. And as long as a human being has not incarnated Christ, we cannot say that he possesses eternal life. Only Christ can give us life and give it to us in abundance. Therefore, we must be less dogmatic and think about the intimate Christ. It's in his lecture, The Alchemical Symbolism of the, the Nativity of Christ. And so we talked about a few of the modifications uh, that have been made to the, 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 the New Testament here. There are a lot, I mean, a lot of changes that we didn't cover. Some of them very large and very dramatic. Um, we don't want to feel you, leave you feeling stranded after kind of clobbering the New Testament in this lecture. Um, and so I want to address two points before we, 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 we finish up. That is, the reliance of, on Scripture and the interpretation of Scripture. Now, many religions have a reliance, a reliance on Scripture, not just Christianity. And many modern people view Scriptures that we have as like a dictation from God. It was the... the, the Someone sat there and, and uh, uh, listened, to, listened to the angel and just, just wrote it down word for word as it was said. And um, that's necessary for them because they, they, they expect people to believe a lot of um, not, very, uh, not very intuitive things because of the words that were said in some book. And they... they are very adamant about the fact that the scripture is absolutely true, 100%. And like the Catholics, for instance, say that the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit protects the scripture, and the, uh, 
The Vulgate in particular, which is the Latin version of the scripture, is, is especially infallible. I've, I've heard Catholics argue to me that the original Hebrew, the, the original Hebrew uh, might be wrong, but St. Jerome's translation of that Hebrew into, the, into Latin, that was accurate, right? <laughs> um, and if it's, uh, actually, when I, was, when I was studying for this lecture, I found that the Vulgate actually had more mistakes in it than the, uh, the English version that I was working from. Because <laughs> the um, so in, in the modern Bible, some, uh, as, as scholars have, have come across these things, some of, some modern Bibles actually do uh, try to uh, try to change them to be more reflective of the uh, of the, the the earlier texts. Some, not all, most don't, and most of the changes that we talk about are still in the modern Bible. Um, but as we saw today, there's an enormous amount of evidence. Um, I just gave you a few things, but there's, there's an enormous amount that, that indicates that the scriptures are really not as infallible as, as many religious groups would have us believe. That, 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 that there's, so, there's been so many changes made for not always the, uh, the most uh, scrupulous of reasons through the ages that have, uh, uh, to, these, to these texts that make us uh, suspect that, that they don't necessarily reflect the, uh, the message that even the original authors were trying to portray. So, what can we do in the face of these, these, uh, these scriptures that have been uh, tampered with? Uh, now, in our tradition, in, in, the, in the, the Gnostic tradition, um, we like to study many different religious traditions and many different scriptures. It's Unlikely, for instance, that the Christological controversies of the uh, uh, happening in Rome are likely to affect the scribes that were copying Buddhist scriptures in India, right? Um, they, 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 they're not going to care. Um, and so it's important to view nothing in isolation, to not take any of the scriptures just like only this, this one thing, and so like this is this is the the uh, the absolute the, the absolute uh, uh, the absolute truth. That's why we call gnosis the doctrine of the synthesis. That we look at many different traditions and many different scriptures, and we 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 see where these where these scriptures overlap, and we we we're able to see that different scriptures from dif different traditions are saying the same thing. And so, if every every scripture from every tradition says the same thing, it's unlikely that they they that they're that they're all wrong. Right? Because the, 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 the things that are influencing the, the, this, the, trans, the transcriptions and the copies and the modifications of these scriptures are going to be uh, different throughout the ages. Um, we, it's also useful for us to have modern masters and, and avatars uh, like, like Samuel and Vior or Master M or the Dalai Lama or, or, even, uh, or even Blavatsky who came, to, who came to, to share the doctrine. People periodically come on the scene in order to refresh and rejuvenate the, Christ, the, the Christic doctrine. But we have to be open to them. Samuel's, uh, Samuel's writings are, are, uh, have, have only been around since 1950, and so we've, we've, we've had much less time for them to be changed over the ages. We can also use common sense. And so where scriptures contradict reality, there's typically one of three things that must be, uh, must be mistaken. Either reality is wrong, the scripture is wrong, or our interpretation of the scripture is wrong. And so when we come, when we come into, this, into this conflict, what do we do? Well, typically the, uh, the, it's a mistake to assume that reality is wrong. Right. We should generally assume that reality is real and that there's something's wrong with either the scripture or with or the, our inter, more likely our interpretation of the scripture. Um, however, there are people in the world who who do when they come into come into this, this conflict where it's either reality, the scripture or their interpretation. They assume that the scripture and their interpretation must be infallible and the problem is with reality. Um, and my advice is to um, to. To not go along with this particular uh, this, this particular mode of thinking, um, and so there are um, there are in the world today who uh, people who claim that, for instance, the Earth was made in in, in uh, is only six thousand years old, or that the uh, dinosaur fossils were 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 created by the devil, 
in order to um, uh, deceive people into, into disbelieving the scriptures, or um, even that uh, the value of pi, 3.14159, etc., is equal to exactly three, because that is the, the, the value of pi that they give in the book of Kings. Um, <laughs> so this mathematical quantity uh, that, that mathematicians have figured out must somehow be mistaken because the Bible says it's wrong. Um, so these people are welcome to have their views, and, and we don't want to take them away, but uh, my advice to you for your own spiritual, uh, your own spiritual practice is, is uh, to don't do that. Um, to put reality and, and, uh, uh, at the top and, and use your common sense when reading these things. And also, to have a reliance on your own inner being and your own experiences in order to, uh, if, when, when, you're, when you're reading these, uh, these texts. Samuel, for instance, was able to see immediately the problems with Exodus at chapter 9. He said, this is... This is uh, uh, Giving a, a, a detailed description about all the uh, uh, all the procedures of how to, to kill a to kill a bull and what what what, what to do with his blood afterwards, and that's, that's 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 rubbish. It's one thing to say we have to destroy the animal ego, but it's another thing to go into detail about how to, to to kill this innocent animal in the physical world. And so he knew that this was this was this was bogus. And so in gnosis, we're concerned with actions, not dogmas. Like Samuel said, gnosis is lived upon facts, upon deeds. It withers away in abstractions. It's difficult to find even in the noblest of thoughts. So even in noble thoughts about virtue and, 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 and Christ in, 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 in the scriptures, even those are not real gnosis. And so this tradition is about, these teachings are about coming to know these teachings in yourself as they emerge from within you and to experience them. So that's all I have to say about the reliance on Scripture. We can also talk about the interpretation of Scripture. How do, how do we read these, these texts? How do we understand the Scriptures that we have? Now, we think it's important to, in this tradition to understand much of the Scriptures symbolically because if you actually read them for what they are, it becomes clear that that's how they were, they were meant to be read. <clears throat> now, some people might be uncomfortable with this. Uh, for instance, during this lecture, we used texts from the Jewish mystical tradition to inform our understanding of the, of the New Testament. And many people will believe things only if they are, uh, only if they are said literally in the Bible. Now, um, an example of this, I, want, I wanted, to, uh, wanted to read this to you because I found it, um, found it hilarious. Irenaeus, in his book Against Heresies, um, was sort of, uh, sort of miffed by people reading uh, the, the scriptures, um, trying to see things in the scriptures that he wasn't able to see, right? And so he gave it a, a, an analogy for... Um, he was one of the guys who was, who was annoyed by uh, people reading the scriptures symbolically. And he was describing these, these people. He said, their manner of acting is just as if one, when a beautiful image of a king has been constructed by some skillful artist out of precious jewels, should then take this likeness of the man all to pieces, should rearrange the gems, and so fit them together as to make them into the form of a dog or a fox, and even then but poorly executed, and to then maintain and declare that this was the beautiful image of the king which the skillful artist had constructed, pointing to the jewels as if they had been admirably fitted together by the first artist to form the image of the king, but have then been by bad effects transferred to the latter one in the shape of a dog, and thus by exhibiting the jewels should then deceive the ignorant, who had no conception of what a king's form should look like, and persuade them that the miserable likeness of the fox was, in fact, the beautiful image of the king, right? And so there, there are a lot of people who are annoyed by our particular, uh, 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 our, our way of reading the scripture. Um, and, and, but ultimately, all of us are going to face the consequences and are going to have to, to, to reap the effects of however we choose to live our life and understand these, understand these doctrines. And so, 
we're not telling you what to do, but uh, we have our, the own ch- our own choices that we make, and that that we uh, through uh, years of, of study and practice we've we've come to uh, we've come to see as as necessary and correct, and so we um, we recommend those uh, this this particular way of understanding the scriptures to you too. It's important to understand also. Um, saying something, uh, uh, try to combat Arrhenius here, that there is no common sense or plain reading of the scripture. That even those who insist on reading the scripture literally or insist on that only what is, was written there in plain language can be true, even those people are bringing a particular bias to their reading of the scripture. Because common sense, by its very nature, implies something in common with a particular context and a particular community. That what's common sense to a monk in the fourth century might be very different to what's common sense to uh, a Presbyterian pastor living in 2014 that the particular ways of understanding not just, not just language, but understanding how to, how to read literature are going to be different between these two groups. And so common sense implies what is common with your, with your group, with your context. We, well, we talked about in our, our previous lectures that, that when we look at the writings of the Desert Fathers, that it's obvious that they, that they understood these, the, these scriptures in a much more metaphorical sense than, than we typically do today. That they were able to see within the scriptures archetypes and symbols that many people in the modern world think view as actually literal, uh, 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 literal commands. But the Desert Fathers saw them as metaphorical, as referring to spiritual archetypes. And so there's the, there's a, the read, a reading of the scripture that you sort of have to um, come to understand that if you really get it, the types of readings that we gave today, like the... Uh, uh, quoted from the Gospel of John and believing of Jesus, that is a type of common sense understanding. That if you read it in the right mindset, you can just see it. Then a lot of times in this, in this school and in these teachings, we like to use our little brackets, right? And we, 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 give, the, we give the scripture and we put, in the, uh, we put in the brackets, this is what the... Uh, uh, these are all the, 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 the things you're supposed to understand by that. That's not meant to be things that we are adding to the scriptures. Those are meant to be things that you're just supposed to be able to see. And we, we include them so that you can, you can see within the verses what we're able to see plainly. And it's also useful in these uh, uh, in our interpretation of the scripture, to have someone like Samuel and Vior. Because he experienced these things, and he interpreted and commented on many of the scriptures in relation to his own experiences. And so he's, he, he lived these things firsthand, and so he's able to comment on many of the, the, the advanced aspects of the path. And so he knew, because he lived it, he knew firsthand what they were talking about. And ultimately, this is the goal of Gnosis. Not to be groping in the dark with the intellect, searching for dogmas. But like we saw in the quote from Samael, to have all the events of Scripture take place within us. And have all of the archetypes in those stories fleshed out and elaborated in our own being. So do you have any questions? Yes. The Venustic initiation, yes, that's something that happens very, very uh, uh, an advanced aspect of the path. Um, 
very, very far. So that's after you've created the, uh, the, the solar bodies, um, you, you, you chose the direct what, path. What would, you what, what, what would you experience? I haven't done it, because that's way, way beyond me. Okay. That's like where some of you are. That's why I usually rely on him for the, uh, the talks, uh, uh, for des uh, descriptions of like the incarnation of the Christ. But he, descri he describes that as the, the, uh, the incarnation of the, uh, the Christic principle within you. Because what was supposed to happen is that the, the Christ, which is Hokmah and the, well, related to Hokmah in the tree life, it's not Hokmah in its title, it's beyond that. But this aspect of the divinity is supposed to come down and incarnate within you, in you, within you in, order to, um, in order to help you eliminate your egos and, 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 uh, and walk the path of initiation. Spontaneously without you actually taking a step-by-step -step path? To no, that would not happen. Would uh, because like, like, like it says in right here, actually, that the, 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 the name or the, the can only be mentioned in, in relation to a completed world. And so you'd need to go through the development of each, in each of these spheres and develop certain uh, in, internal, internal bodies, or we call them solar bodies, in order to be able to handle that energy within you. And so it, it can't just happen miraculously. It's something that would have to happen uh, as, as a process of development. Energy and then, you know, not be able to handle it, perhaps you break down and end up somewhere else, like in a mental hospital and come back out, like what happened? Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know of, of, of cases like that happening. This is, this is an intelligent force here, and this is God who loves you, so I don't think he would want to, uh, want to do anything to hurt you. This is, it's, not, it's not like it's, it's, a random, it's a random force of nature. This is an intelligent well, yes, it's entity here. Yeah. yeah. So it's, Considering the capacity of the human body or mind to handle the force. Yeah, an, ordinary, an ordinary human would not be able to do that. That's why... That's why the, uh, we have this, this, the, the path of spiritual development in order to develop certain, uh, 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 certain internal, internal bodies uh, related to the heart and the mind and the will in order to be able to handle the, the, uh, this energy and be able to um, uh, uh, yeah. and then control when it. When you're yeah. referencing the common denominator between you know, the mystic stream that unites the ancient yeah. religions, that would apply to like the perennial philosophy or all those stuff like that. Yes, yeah, the perennial philosophy. Yeah, okay. yeah. Any other questions? No? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Here we go. So, uh, what would you recommend as an original, an older Bible, I guess, that we can read or some text that we should use versus our modern interpretation? Or if there's a, a software program that's already compiled? There are none that I know of, because like I said, there is, uh, we don't have original copies of any of, the, any of the New Testament texts, and so there are, um, even, even the, uh, the oldest versions that we have are, uh, there are, there are, there are, there are differences between them, and so it's, it's, uh, there's no like unified source. It's a whole, it's a whole field of study to try to compare different versions of these texts and try to find out wh like which, uh, wh which uh, uh, scriptures do we, we consider more authoritative uh, compared to others. It's, 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 it's not like there's one oldest version. There's like, we have a whole, a whole set of very old, very old manuscripts. Some of them are just partial pieces, like we have this, this uh, like, like a, a ripped shard here of this verse and a, uh, uh, a page here from this verse. It's, 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 uh, people dedicate their lives to trying to figure out what the, what the, actual, um, what the actual Bible, uh, the authors originally said. And I'll give you another example that I didn't talk about in the, uh, in, in the lecture. In, the, in, uh, in, in Luke, there's, um, there's a, it, when Jesus in, is in the garden, um, he, he's saying, uh, you're familiar with this, um, there's, he says, and he, would, he, and he was withdrawn from them uh, about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as, uh, was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, it, he was, it was come to his disciples. He found them sleeping for sorrow. Right. Now, even as early as the second century, there are two different versions of that text, 
right? So um, in one version is the version I just read to you. In another version, the, the, the verses about the angel and sweating blood just aren't there. They're just completely gone, right? And um, both, of those, both of those versions of the text are fairly, uh, fairly prominent within the second century. And we have no idea which one is real, which one is, which one is the original one, I mean. Um, so we think that that verse was either added or deleted somewhere, sometime within the second century. Um, it's in our, that, that verse happens to be in our modern Bible, and we just have no way of knowing whether, it's, whether it was in the original, uh, the, the, the original uh, copy of that, that, that gospel or not. And so there's, um, unfortunately, the answer to your question is, is, is there is no consolidated source. I'm sorry. It's just a, it's a whole field of, of, of inquiry. Not that I, not that I'm aware of. Um, there are there are lots of academic texts that are that go into um, talking about like where we where we might cons- where, uh, differences between the different sources, uh, but but I don't think there's any sort of consolidated uh, entity. Yes. So your lecture was really from a kind of an academic. And in, in Gnosis, where we're, you know, the idea behind this is experience. Yes. And so in the absence of experience, we tend to rely on the masters who've gone before us and done this work and have experienced this. Yes. So people like Master Samaran Lior and HBB who synthesized a lot of this and, as you said, bring this back and, and make a lot of this new. So... I wonder if you could talk about how we could access our own intuition as we read these dead letters, Mm -hmm. as well as um, actually going into into the Akashic records, because wouldn't the original text be in the Akashic records that we could could actually consult that actual Akashic record? It might be, I haven't checked. (laughs) <laughs> um, it's difficult because even then it would, it, it, there's, there's, uh, there are subjective aspects of our psychology that can modify our experiences, right? Because we're, we're full of ego and we're full of uh, our, our, our consciousness is tainted by our, um, and our perception is tainted by our own mind. And that could influence what we see in the astral plane, for instance. Um, and so it's, uh, it's difficult to use that as, as, a, as a sole source. The whole, but the whole teachings of, of, of Gnosis are meant, to, um, are meant to guide us to these experiences. And when we're reading the scriptures, I, like, for instance, when I read the scripture, my, I, my mind gets very, very silent. Like, uh, even if my mind was busy before I sit down with a, with a text, there's something within me that... that recognizes that what I'm doing is extremely important here. There's just everything just quiets down. And I completely immerse myself just in that and think only about that. And it helps also to meditate on the scriptures after you've, um, after you've read them. And so we, we, we teach meditation here to, um, in, in, in different techniques to meditate on different verses of the scripture and just Hold them in your mind and, and see what emerges out of that. And that can be very useful in helping, helping us to understand uh, what's truly in, the, uh, in these verses. That the scriptures themselves are not meant to be read like, like, a, like a, a book or a newspaper. They're meant to touch the consciousness. And even if you read the books of Samuel and Vior, I've, I've found that his, his works affect me in the same way. That uh, even, be, even before I... Um, I was really into Gnosis. There was something about his works that just like, I recognized that what, before I, I even knew what he was saying, I, I recognized that there was something important in front of me here, like I was reading a scripture. I was able to see, like, even though I, I, I have no idea what this guy's saying, that, that this was something that was important for me to understand. And when I sat down with it, uh, the understanding started, started to emerge from within. And so you have, to, you have to be able to 
be skilled at, at, at looking within, at being able to quiet the mind and focus inside. And so we have, we have, uh, we have techniques that we use for uh, like, like, like transmutation, like pranayamas or, 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 or vowels that we use for, for, for intuition. But there's also, uh, th those are very, very useful. Um, you, 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 get a, you get a lot that emerges from you when you uh, do pranayamas, for instance. Um, but um, it's also just being able to look at it with, with an open mind and being able to see with your mind unclouded what's there. So would you say, I mean, how would you describe the Gnosis experience as the Gnostics would have understood it back then or, or now, you know, like if you to be in the moment of having the Gnosis, it's like, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? You know, you know what I mean? Yes. You do? But it's, 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 do you, it's just that I was just... Do you know what I'm, what I'm talking about? Do you? Yeah, I do. Wait, but no, do you, have you had the, wait, do you know? I gave you the answer, but you weren't listening. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, like, as in, you know you had this, like, right, Of wait. course, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Do you have a date? Do you have a date? Did something happen where the universe told you that you know? It's not, it's not really like that. It's an experience of the consciousness. Right, exactly. And it's something that is not common to a normal person's perception of reality. It's like it's, 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 it, sh it should be common. It's what the consciousness is supposed to be. But because our mind is, is clouded, the obstacle, the obstacle to that is, is our own mind. So, so when, the, when the obstacles in the mind are removed, we start to have a deeper experience of... of what reality actually is. And, and in response to your question, yes, I have. But what I was trying, it, the answer that I gave you was actually Zen, right? And so in the Zen tradition, um, they use that, the sound, just the, the startling, just like that, to sort of shock you into that awakening of the consciousness. Just, <gasps> And then you're free of the mind, and you know, right? right. And the mind is, the, the, you, you, you're, you're, you're free, you're free, you're free from that. It's not, it doesn't even come as, as words. No, it doesn't. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not in language. It's, it's deeper than that from, from within. And like, there's signs, and you see the signs, yeah. and they lead you to certain places, and then you find out later that, I guess it, what gives it validity to me was that I didn't know anything about it, and then it became, the signs became tra translatable by other people they, that they, they saw, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There was, a, there was a structure to it, which it was either A, you're going insane, or B, <laughs> somehow there's this commonality or coincidental experience that's been going on for about a millennium of, of time, mm -hmm. and then without knowing anything about it, the parallels all match up, and these people all didn't end up in a mental hospital, so the cop was great, they, they didn't make any sense. Yeah. So, but it, it would be classified as a supernatural experience. Mm -hmm. I've definitely suffered a lot afterwards trying to uh, uh, sublimate it into this reality mm -hmm. because it doesn't make any sense to anyone. Else. My, um, except for a few in my, 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 it my, matches so well certain people's yeah. experiences that it's like, well, wait a second, this is, this is, this is no, this is what it is. In my personal life, I, I, I generally don't talk about this, um, and so I, I don't. You can talk to me later, then. Talk to me later if you want. I, I don't. I, I, I don't. After. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, talk to me. Talk to me after then, because you're right. Yeah, it's 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 um it's it's. Please. One, it's, con it's considered it's considered it's considered bad form to talk about our own personal experience, and and uh, also like when I'm I'm. Well, talking to like friends and family, or in like the the no, the, the, pers the, the professional world. Yeah, I, it's it's good to to like, to be discreet. I'm an, I'm an academic. I'm yeah, just like you, so I understand yeah. that we, if we keep it within the terms of logic, and logos, and the, the words on the screen, then we're okay. Yeah, we're it's, it's good. To, it's it's uh, especially when we're out in public. It's good to be uh, discreet because okay. we it's it's um, it's it's not it's not helpful to have people um, thinking that we're crazy. And it's it's um, uh, most most people won't uh, don't understand this. It was happening. I I was I knew I was saying because I knew if I told anyone they would think I was crazy. That's yeah. That was the weirdest part about it was that I 
couldn't understand how I could be sane, but then no other people would say that this is the definition of the sane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll stop yeah. now. Sure. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Well, uh, <clears throat> let with the lecture, right? The lecture, okay. All, all numbers are living entities. Yeah. And as living entities, we have to meditate on each one of them in order to discover the meaning of them. This is what Gnosis is, right? Yeah. For instance, one of those living entities is the number 18. Number 18. Which is Twilight. Uh, described as occult enemies. Yeah. Or the beast. The beast. Right? Yeah. Because uh, in the book of Revelation, he described the beast 666. Yeah. Which makes a vision of 18. 18. Yeah. But according to certain scriptures that I was precisely uh, uh, reading, the uh, scripture number 15, they say, that the, which is the most original of Revelation, uh -huh. states that the beast was 616. 616. Yeah, this is what they describe. Interesting. You know? and, they, and then they are now, they are arguing now. <laughs> they don't know. Yeah. It was 660. 666 six, six or 616. Or 616. Yeah. But because they don't know the, the meaning of the numbers, this is precisely one, one of the points. Right? Yeah. The people get lost with that. Uh, when they rely on what is written, only, only, only on uh, only on the dead letter. Yeah, it's it's yeah. difficult. It's difficult to um, if 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 you don't if you don't know, it's difficult to know how to parse these things out. And so, six hundred sixty six makes perfect sense in there because it's it's the it's the the, the six arcanum indecision in the three brains, yep. right? The the beast embodied within you that becomes eighteen, uh, which is the number of this the secret enemy, which is the. Uh, it's the nine above and the nine below. So the eight, the eighteen is the nine is the the the, the spheres of the Klippoth, right? Mm -hmm. Relates to that, and so we could we could see that. We um, there's also a dispute about the, about like uh, how do we number the commandments, right? Because there's like, like eighty different versions of numbering the commandments. But if you uh, if you see how the commandments relate to the uh, the different spheres of the Kabbalah, it becomes obvious how to number the commandments. You don't have to you don't have to to try to figure out how to parse the verses. You just see oh. The commandments have to be, uh, k k k k each of those ten commandments relates to one of the, uh, the ten spheres of the Kabbalah. We know, we, we, we know what each of those spheres represents. We can see the correspondence with the commandments, right? So it's, it's, uh, we, have to, we have to interpret it in, in, the, in the context of, of what, it, what we know it does mean based on our own, our, our own meditation, our own experiences. Yeah. So yes, you're exactly right. <laughs> Yes. This is more of a comment. But okay. Tell me that the Quran there's actually only one version everywhere. The original language. There's only one version of the Quran. I don't know. I haven't studied the Quran. Maybe there. Maybe it is. That was interesting. Hmm. There are a lot of Christians who would say that about the Bible too. I'm not sure I'd believe them. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? There's definitely not one version of the Bible. But they're saying like all the versions of the Quran that they've ever seen, they've all been the same. Interesting. I haven't studied it. I don't know. That was interesting. Anything else? Oh, Miguel, one more. <laughs> trying to start a potluck here. <laughs> how do we present the, the information in this lecture to somebody who is studying modern versions of the Bible and has that uh, misinterpretation of the Bible? Uh, you can present it however, how, how, uh, however you want. When, you, when you're giving information to someone, you, you kind of have to be able to, to, um, to... It helps to know them and be able to navigate their mind. And so you can, uh, if you know someone, you can understand certain things that will, that will vibrate with them. It also depends on when... Uh, timing can have, a, can have a, 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 an important aspect of this too. Sometimes people's minds are open, and sometimes people's minds are closed. I've said the same things to the same person on different occasions, and once, uh, sometimes they're just like, yeah, whatever, and other times it really hits them. And so you sort of have to, uh, if you're t thinking about a particular person, um, you sort of have to know the person, know how to navigate their mind, and, and know what, they, what they, they hold close to their heart and what, they, what, what, what sort of things they're thinking about in order to find something that would be um, uh, useful to them. And so, it de like I said, it depends on the person that you're, uh, that you're talking about. Thank you all. Thank you.
To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,